You can see uh, in the bottom left here, you touch your fingers from your right hand and your left hand, it gives you a lead one rhythm strip. And you can see in real time the ECG, as well as you can create a PDF of the 30 second uh, strip. So there's two devices. There's one capable of a single lead and one capable of a single lead or a six lead. So this is an example of the single lead. This is what you would see on your phone as you're recording your EKG. It counts down the time, it gives you your heart rate, and you can actually see the QRS complexes uh, as you're recording. This is actually an example of my EKG. So this is lead one. Uh, and this is how it would look like in a PDF format for a 30 second strip. Uh, this device uses the standard sweep speed and gain similar to a 12 lead ECG that you would take in clinic. They also have the six lead, which is nice about this device. Uh, they get the six lead by adding an, a, another electrode to the back of the device. And you touch that electrode to either your left knee or your left ankle. And again, this is an example of my six lead EKG. Um, with all six limb leads, one, two, three, ABR, AVL, AVF. And this is just eight seconds because these are all simultaneous recordings. I did notice with this device, you have to be very still, um, specifically if you're putting on your knee or ankle. So that might be a, more, a little bit more challenging for people with a tremor or, or older individuals. So the automated read by the device is several possibilities. It can tell you it's possible AFib, it's normal or sinus rhythm, or it's unreadable. So you can tell this device, specifically the algorithm is looking for AFib, not other arrhythmias, not ischemia, etc. So this is an example of what it would look like. This is just clipped the top of my PDF. Um, so it gave me my heart rate, the duration, uh, and it gave me a, a normal read. Um, even though the heart rate was 54, which I would code as sinus brady, it, it called this normal because it's not AFib and it's not unreadable and it's in sinus rhythm. So this is an interesting study. Uh, this was done in the UK and published in 2017 in circulation, the rehearse AFib study. So it was a randomized controlled trial of AFib screening using the CardioMobile. They had about 1,000 patients, a little bit of an enriched patient population. You had to be 65 years or older to get into the study and have a chads vas score of two or greater, and you could not have a diagnosis of AFib. And they were randomized to twice weekly uh, CardioMobile ECGs versus just routine care. And in this study, routine care just meant normal follow-up with their general practitioner. And they actually got a four times increased diagnosis in AFib with this strategy. So it was 1% in the routine care arm and a 4% in the uh, twice weekly ECG arm. This potentially has huge implications because we're gonna see a lot more of these devices. You can buy these devices with a health spending account or a flexible spending account. Um, so potentially a lot more people could be buying these devices and screening themselves even if it's not at the direction of their physician. So clinical utility of the cardiac, like I just mentioned, screening for AFib. This could either be physician directed or patient uh, directed. You can evaluate palpitations on demand, which in some cases can lead to a diagnosis. In some cases, maybe provide reassurance or manage this at home, avoid ER visits. Uh, you can evaluate the effectiveness of rhythm control for AFib. You could confirm rhythm before a uh, pill in pocket, flecainide or propafenone. And there's even some data that you can measure QTC. The device can accurately measure QTC. Not that it gives you the QTC reading, but you could potentially be at home taking EKGs and send them to your physicians for QTC measurements. So next I wanna talk about the smartwatch, which I think is gonna be the dominant device in this field, and I'll show you why. Um, really, this is two complementary technologies. If there's one thing you take away from this talk, it's, it's this. So the smartwatch has photoplethysmography, or PPG, um, and also the ability to do EKG, in this case, single lead, lead one EKG. Important to know, I highlighted this. This was an evolution uh, of incorporating both these technologies into one device. So PPG came first. So large studies, such as the Apple Heart Study, which was the New England Journal study of over 400,000 patients in 2019, um, that only, those watches did not have EKG capability. They just had PPG. So that was assessing the ability of PPG to detect AFib. The current watches integrate both technologies, but very important, not all current watches, new releases have both of these. So not all watches have ECG, even if they may be a smart watch with a PPG algorithm to detect AFib. So most of the research and most of what these devices are designed to do is to evaluate AFib. So for detection, it's really by photoplethysmography. This can be on in the background while you do your daily activities. 
um, PPG works. So this is two LEDs, in this case, green light um, PPG. It basically flashes light onto the skin. Some of that light is absorbed by the blood and some is reflected back. And the amount reflected back is proportional to the blood volume, which can help you calculate a heart rate or more specifically the pulse rate in the wrist. It then can generate a notification to the patient. And it can be either high heart rate notification, low heart rate notification, or more specifically an irregular heart uh, rhythm notification. This is taken directly from the supplement of the Happel Heart Study. And this is sort of their uh, algorithm for generating this notification. So it's, cons it's measuring this PPG signal data and it gets the intervals between pulses and it assesses for regularity. So it can categorize it as either regular or irregular. So in the background, it's screening about every two hours, maybe more, because it only does this when the patient is sitting still. It doesn't do this when the patient's moving. So it periodically is checking with the PPG. Is it regular or irregular? If they get an irregular, um, irregular tachygram, it'll increase the frequency to about every, as, as frequent as every 15 minutes, as long as they're still. And then you need five out of six consecutive irregular tachygrams to then generate a notification. They did this to increase the positive predicted value. So it's not just every time you have a single irregular tachygram that does not generate um, a notification. This is what the patient sees. So they'll get a notification on their watch as well as their phone. If, they're, if they have a watch that's capable of ECG, this, this is Apple Watch I'm talking about, so series four through six do have the capability of ECG, it'll prompt them to then take a confirmatory ECG. So I'm gonna briefly go over the Apple Heart study um, because it's controversial. It could be an entire grand rounds in itself, but I specifically wanted to focus in on, on one issue, the positive predictive values reported in the study. So again, over 400,000 patients enrolled. It's a blockbuster study. It's very innovative. Um, of those 400,000, about 2,000 received an irregular pulse notification. Of those 2,000, 945 uh, were actually included in the first study visit. Of those patients, 658 actually had a patch monitor shipped. Again, they did not have the ability to take a on-the-spot ECG. So they had an irregular notification. They saw the doctor. They then had a patch uh, shipped to them. Um, and of those, 450 actually returned the patch for analysis. And then 254 completed the end of study survey. So the, the big blockbuster number of over 400,000 of those who actually had an irregular um, rhythm notification and returned the patch, um, it was only uh, 254 that actually completed the end of the study. So you get wildly different positive predictive values. So the positive predictive value of that first initial um, irregular notification and then subsequently being diagnosed with AFib was 0.34, quite low. But if you had an irregular pulse notification while wearing the patch, meaning they could correlate right away with, with ECG, it went up to 0.84. So nowadays with all the current watches, you could immediately confirm or, or um, refute the, the irregular pulse notification. And then they also assessed individual tachygram. How good was the individual tachygram at uh, correlating with AFib? It was 0.71. So by requiring five out of six, they increased the positive predictive value to 0.84. So again, if PPG is for detection, uh, ECG is for confirmation. So you do this, you can get a 30 second lead one rhythm strip by touching your right uh, index finger to the digital crown. This is the digital crown, it's an electrode. And the second electrode is on the back of the watch. So again, you get lead one. So what do I think the ideal algorithm is for maximal positive predictive value? You take a patient with high pretest probability or known paroxysmal AFib, and they turn on the irregular rhythm notification feature on their smartwatch. Why do I say that? It's important for you to know this is not automatically on. So it's not like you buy a smartwatch, you take it out of the box, and it is immediately testing you for AFib. You have to opt in to be to this notification. Um, so they turn on the notifications, then they receive an irregular rhythm notification based on the PPG signal data, and they're prompted to then take a confirmatory ECG. And then the patient takes several confirmatory ECGs, again, because you might have one that's unreadable, but if you have multiple, you have more data. And then if it's auto-read as AFib, they contact their physician for uh, review. 
So something like this was studied in the WATCH AFib trial in 2019. This was an enriched population. It was a hospitalized uh, population. They took half of patients with known paroxysmal AFib, and then they matched those to half without AFib. And they were using a smartwatch, it was a Samsung watch, and they were testing the PPG algorithm, but they were also simultaneously, if they had near regular notification, they were taking an ECG with a CardioMobile. And then what they did is they had uh, two cardio blinded cardiologists review the IECG from the CardioMobile to determine if the patient had AFib or not, and they compared that to the PPG determination of AFib. And in this type of setting, they had a much higher positive predictive value of a 97.8%. Um, a big criticism of this study, which the authors fully acknowledge in the discussion, is they of the 672 patients, they excluded 142 from the analysis because there's insufficient quality of the PPG recording. So if you included those, you would get a markedly different uh, positive predictive value. Uh, however, um, this is something that could probably be improved over time by improving the technology. Another very interesting study, which I think used the most ideal algorithm, um, this was the smartwatch performance for the detection and quantification of atrial fibrillation. So there was two parts to the study. There was a, they were testing this smart rhythm 2.0 algorithm that they created by using uh, ECG data from 7,500 Alive Core users. To train, to train the algorithm. Then to validate that algorithm, they used a cohort of 24 patients who had known paroxysmal AFib and they had an implantable cardiac monitor. In this case, it was the reveal link. And they had over 31,000 hours of simultaneous watch and link recordings. And in this study, they were able to get a 97% sensitivity for individual AFib episodes, a 97% sensitivity for the AFib duration, because in this study, the watch was measuring heart rate every five seconds, regardless of uh, patient motion. And then on a per patient analysis, it was a 83.3% sensitivity for diagnosing AFib over an hour. This is, again, this is the sort of how they conducted this study, and I think is the ideal algorithm if you're going to screen someone or monitor someone for AFib. So on panel A, you can see the watch. It shows heart rate data on the top, and in green, it's sort of normal sinus. And then in the orange that's flagged, the heart rate jumps up, and it's uh, flagged orange for AFib. And just below that, they actually show patient mobility. So the patient wasn't moving, and the heart rate jumped up, and it was irregular. So it generated this notification that you have an unexpected heart rate. We recommend you take an ECG. Patient takes an ECG, read as possible AFib with the heart rate of 118. Also in the study, they really looked a lot at AFib duration, the ability these watches to quantify duration. This is an example of, on the top panel, the data from the watch. And in green, it was calling it sinus rhythm. And then at red, the patient went into AFib and it was correctly identifying AFib at multiple checks throughout the day. So the watch found at about 11 hours of AFib, and this correlated with the findings on the link, which was also about 11 hours of AFib that day, and then they converted the next day. So I like to think of the smartwatch as sort of the Swiss army knife. Um, it can do a lot of different things. Um, instead of like a nail file and a corkscrew and a toothpick, it can monitor you for AFib, it can be a GPS, and you can respond to text messages. Um, but the clinical utility, um, you can, diagnose AFib, you can monitor AFib, you can monitor uh, AFib burden potentially after a rhythm control strategy, you can also assess palpitations on demand, you can monitor the heart rate, you can set a, um, a low heart rate notification, for example if you have people on beta blockers you can set the notification wherever you want, 55 beats per minute, 50 beats per minute, 45 beats per minute, um, you can really get individualized. So summary of wearables versus portables. So CardioMobile, uh, it's a specific function to take an EKG. You take a spot check EKG. It can take six leads, which the watch cannot do. There's also some data for at-home QTC monitoring with physician guidance. The smartwatch, again, sort of the Swiss Army knife. It's multifunctional. It allows for passive rhythm monitoring with the PPG and then active confirmatory ECG or, or also spot check ECGs. So let's talk about some real cases, uh, some I've seen in clinic and some are published reports. So this is the 67-year-old male runner. He runs 12 to 15 miles uh, three to four times per week. He's got hypertension controlled on a single agent. He developed some bothersome palpitations. He had an echo, showed basically a normal heart other than a mildly enlarged left atrium. 
Uh, he had a two-week Holter monitor, which showed no arrhythmias, but he also didn't have his palpitations during that monitored time. He, had a, he already had a smartwatch, so he turned on his uh, rhythm notification. He received an irregular rhythm notification and took multiple single lead EKGs. Uh, all the auto reads were AFib. He went to his cardiologist's office that morning that this happened and a 12 lead confirmed he was an AFib. And then he was referred to, um, he was started on Pixaban and referred to EP clinic to discuss rhythm control options. So this is actually his, one, of, one of his EKGs he brought in. He brought a binder of like 20 EKGs, so clearly AFib. Uh, the rate is only 64. And just for reference, this is his sinus rhythm EKG, which was taken after uh, he converted on his own. And you can see clear P waves and it's regular. So he was correctly diagnosed by his, his Apple Watch and he uh, was started on treatments and is, is um, being protected from stroke. Uh, this is another case. This is a 57-year-old lady with uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. She lives several states away from Texas. Uh, one year ago, she underwent a dual lung transplant here at Methodist, and she had an uncomplicated post-op course. One month ago, she received a high heart rate notification on her Apple Watch Series 6. This was accompanied by mild nonspecific specific symptoms. She told me nothing I would have gone to the doctor for. Then she received an irregular rhythm notification when the heart rate was a little bit lower. She took a single lead EKG, it was auto read as AFib. She called her pulmonologist, he prescribed a Pixaban, said go to a clinic by you, get a 12 lead EKG. Um, just for reference, this is her baseline sinus rhythm EKG, fairly unremarkable, a little bit of T-wave abnormalities in the uh, V1 through V3. And then this was her EKG uh, when she ended up coming to clinic. Uh, so. It's not AFib, it's actually an atypical flutter, but it's irregular, irregular. So the good and the bad of this device. So it correctly identified an arrhythmia in this patient, but it was the wrong arrhythmia. It, it, died, it called AFib instead of a flutter. We still needed a 12 lead ECG to determine the rhythm with a physician review. Although the patient did receive earlier treatment than she would have otherwise. And ultimately she underwent definitive rhythm control with catheter ablation. This was a published case. It was actually a case series of two cases where the Apple Watch identified ventricular tachycardia. So this is an example of a gentleman who had palpitations. He bought a watch himself and he was in his car. He took an EKG. It was this. He then went to the ED. By the time he got there, it was sinus rhythm. Um, they sent him home basically with the plans for an outpatient monitor because this was thought to be artifact. He then added again, he came back. This time they did a, admitted him, did a workup. Cardiac MRI was suggestive of ARVC. He actually went for an EP study. He had multiple VTs that were inducible from the right ventricle. And this was his scar map showing scar in the RV outflow tract and the free wall. And he ended up getting a defibrillator for a sustained VT. So pitfalls and the unknowns. This is a big criticism of these devices, uh, potential for false positives. So this is showing in blue uh, the prevalence of wearable devices used by age and the AFib prevalence by age. And you can see much more young people when the prevalence is low it, are using these devices. Whereas people who are older who have higher prevalence are not using these devices as frequently, which is a fair criticism. I would say that because you have to turn this notification on, not everyone is being monitored at a young age. Also, who's to say in five years this isn't the curve, or in 10 years this isn't the curve? So I think the prevalence of these devices will increase across the board. Also, we have to acknowledge that different devices perform differently, and there's a lot of different devices on the market. This is from a study um, of post-op cardiac surgery patients, and this is actually from the same patient in the same episode of AFib. He was wearing one watch on one wrist and the other watch on the other wrist, and Apple Watch Series 3 tracked AFib pretty well in terms of the heart rate. Fitbit charge, you could still tell it was abnormal, but didn't track as well. These watches are already outdated and older watches. So again, this is advancing very quickly. It's hard to stay on top of all the different models and different manufacturers, but the devices do perform differently. So the, like I'm saying, there's variation between models and manufacturers. So even the AFib algorithms are markedly different. Some algorithms are only applicable to heart rates of of 100 beats per minute. So above that, it'll just say you have a high heart rate. It won't tell you have an irregular heart rate. You might have AFib. Um, and then some are valid up to 150 beats per minute and higher. 
the battery life of these devices is also markedly different. For the watches, I've seen ranges anywhere from 18 hours to six days. So obviously it's not monitoring you if your watch isn't on your wrist um, uh, tracking you. And then we have to acknowledge costs. Um, some of these are as cheap as $50 and some are up to an over $400. So maybe not affordable for all our patients if they want it. So closing thoughts. You will see this in your clinic if you have not already. I think most cardiologists have probably seen this in their clinic, but I think this will be in general practitioners clinic. This will be in a lot of clinics. Um, direct to consumer mobile rhythm monitoring is here to stay. So even though if you go on blogs and the internet, there's a lot of backlash from a lot of physicians about why are companies directly marketing to patients that should be sort of physician led, but this is here to stay. Um, this is, I think this is very useful in the right patient. Um, I think all cardiologists should invest some time in learning about this technology. Personally, I think the best way is to buy one of these devices, test it yourself, figure out how to use it. That way you can help explain it to your patient or at least know what, uh, what is going on if the patient comes to you with some data from these devices. I think we're gonna have a better understanding of AFib prevalence in a younger population and what to do about that. So if we detect AFib in a 30 year old, what does that mean? How do we treat that? I think that's kind of the unknown. And then um, definitely we need randomized controlled trials looking at um, outcomes um, because right now we're kind of a little bit going blind in terms of outcomes. And that's it for my presentation. Peter, uh, thank you. That was, that was really fantastic. That was an interesting topic uh, and well presented. Uh, a lot of data that I didn't know about and I, I've learned quite a lot. Uh, we have just a minute for some questions now and then we probably will have time with, uh, after the next presentation to come back for some more questions. Um, so a couple of important messages. Uh, first one is, you know, don't get into a knife fight with the Swiss Army. Exactly. Um, the second one is these watches have changed uh, enormously in these devices, and, and I think we're all seeing that, and I've got mine on, and it tells me lots of things. Um, how close are we to, you know, the watch, the Apple Watch specifically, being an event monitor, a Holter replacement? Uh, so it's... Depends why you're using it. If you're looking for palpitations, I already think it's a Holter replacement. So if they have symptoms and they can trigger the recording, it's, it's a replacement. If you're doing a two-week Holter for, let's say they did an AFib ablation and the patient really wants to come off anticoagulation, which this is not guidelines, but a lot of patients want to come off anticoagulation. Let's say it's been a year, they've had no clinical AFib, you want to test them uh, continuously. You could do an implantable link, or you could do maybe a two-week monitor. If they have zero AFib, you could maybe have a joint discussion about coming off anticoagulation. So in that regard, I don't think you could come off. Um, but I do think eventually it'll replace entirely uh, Holter monitoring. Good, good. Um, I think you're probably right. Um, let's go to the online question for one question, and then we'll change speakers. Um, Fantastic uh, lecture, Pete. Uh, this is from Dr. Uh, T, who uh, was our chief fellow who gave us uh, these ground rounds two weeks ago. Uh, his question is, do you think these devices are ready for pull in pocket? I'm sure he means pill in pocket, uh, anticoagulation, uh, DOAC for atrial fibrillation. So this is actually being studied in a large randomized controlled trial um, right now. I think they're already enrolling uh, by Dr. Passman up at Northwestern. I didn't include this in my talk because this could be a whole talk in itself, but I don't think they're ready yet until we have the results of the trial. But yes, I think, I think eventually we're going to enter the era of pill and pocket anticoagulation. So right now we treat someone who has six hours of AFib once per year, the same as someone who's in continuous atrial fibrillation uh, persistently. And we know that burden matters. Um, it's not purely just Chad's vest. Burden definitely matters. So I think if, if we improve the watch and it becomes much more reliable and we have randomized controlled trials showing that there's no difference in uh, embolic stroke risk, we might enter this era of pill and pocket anticoagulation. So patient detects AFib on their watch, they take anticoagulation that day, direct uh, oral anticoagulation can be effective in two hours and maybe they take it for a month, no more, no more AFib, they don't take it the rest of the year um, or to their next episode. But this is not a uh, guideline base yet, and we don't have trials showing this would work yet. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, don't go anywhere. We may come back to you after the next presentation. Um, okay, switching gears then. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, Hassan uh, Raymond. Hassan uh, went to Aga Khan um, 
University in Karachi, Pakistan. I uh, studied uh, biochemistry uh, and community health. Um, came to Houston and did internal medicine training at Houston Methodist, followed by cardiology at Houston Methodist, um, and is then off to Arizona shortly to do interventional cardiology. Uh, Hassan is going to talk to us about cardiovascular education during COVID, so uh, challenges that are near and dear to all of us. So over to you, sir. Right. Thank you, Dr. Dell. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say it's, uh, it's a huge honor to be presenting on this platform where I've seen firsthand over the last three years many greats of cardiology uh, take center stage. Um, so like Dr. Little mentioned, I'm going to be talking about cardiovascular education during COVID-19. Unfortunately, it was um, the dominant theme over the last uh, year and a half of, of our General Cardiology Fellowship. And with uh, cautious optimism, at least in the United States with cases coming down, it seems like a good time um, to talk about how it impacted us and, and what lessons we've actually learned from this. And those will be the objectives of, of my talk. We're going to be talking about the impact that COVID-19 had on our education, um, some of the innovations and the adaptations that we had um, that were designed to mitigate some of the uh, adverse impact uh, that, that, that was felt. And then finally, uh, look at some <coughs> of the lessons that we may have learned from, from this uh, period to apply them for future training of cardiovascular fellows um, to train them better. So jumping straight ahead to the impact, and as soon as um, you think of impact in cardiology fellows, the first thing that generally comes to mind is uh, patient and procedural volumes. This, of course, um, varied quite a bit from different with, with, between different institutions and dif different geographical areas, but typically it starts probably a drop of 30 to 60 percent, which probably sounds about right. Um, primary reasons for that would be that there was fewer, or in some cases, no elective procedures to allow, to ca to allow for um, a surge in pandemic cases in any geographical location at any point in time. Other reasons, of course, include that many fellows in training were reassigned to non-cardiovascular service lines, typically ICUs and medicine services. Uh, according to a national poll, about 38% of fellows reported that they were assigned to, no to these services. Um, and then finally, um, Another thing that happened was that patients were reluctant to come to hospitals and clinics during the pandemic uh, due to the fear of contracting uh, COVID. According to one study, about 42% of adults said that they, were, they, they had a delay in seeking care, even in emergent situations because, because of this fear. Um, uh, the concept of lower volumes was obviously not unique to cardiology alone. But uh, I want to say it probably is given maybe more importance in cardiology compared to some of the other specialties. Uh, some of that is centered around the fact that to achieve level two and level three certifications in, um, in cardiology during your general or advanced fellowships, you, cert you need to me uh, meet uh, certain uh, procedural volumes or certain time, uh, certain durations of training within that specific field. Um, so that obviously was a cause of concern. Interventional ex Cardiology, for example, there was a study that was done at, at the height of the pandemic in New York, uh, which cited that uh, program directors, about 21% of them, felt that the interventional cardiology fellows might not meet 250 PCIs, which is the volumes that they typically need to graduate from interventional cardiology fellowship. And even beyond numbers and volumes, um, in a lot of geographical areas, the pandemic was worse between April and June, which is typically the last quarter of an academic year. And this is around the time that graduating fellows probably enjoy the most autonomy. Um, in terms of taking care of the patients or procedures. And so being affected at that time of the year would obviously have a lot of significance just about when you're about to go and practice uh, independently. Um, another aspect of education, of course, which was um, impacted severely by COVID is didactics. So traditionally, at least before the pandemic, uh, cardiology didactics would uh, consist of either small or large group conferences, whether it be core lectures or grand rounds, multidisciplinary conferences, and then bedside uh, and, and lab teaching. And COVID, and with, um, along with uh, social, uh, media, uh, social distancing, um, requirements meant that most of these in-person didactics were canceled. Uh, inpatient teams were also downsized, whether they were uh, rounding or teams or imaging teams or procedural teams, which of, of course led to minimal bedside and small group teaching as well. 
Um, of course, uh, the cancellations were not limited to um, uh, to your uh, to institutions alone. They went uh, to cardiology workshops. Some of them are specifically designed for uh, cardiology fellows and actually quite popular, like pacemaker courses that a lot of uh, fellows uh, typically tend to go to. There are some people uh, who go to sky training workshops. The ones who are interested in interventional cardiology, for example, um, major cardiology meetings such as ACC, AHA, TCT. A lot of these had to be moved to virtual, while some of them actually had to be canceled as well. And then, of course, the uh, boot camps, which a lot of fellows like attending just before uh, they start their, car or around the time they start the cardiology fellowship, um, they were canceled or went virtual. The one, of course, the one at our institution, which is quite popular, had to go virtual as well last year. One of the things uh, that we need to talk about is fellow well-being. It's probably the hardest to measure, but it's definitely our of, or one of the most important ones that we need to definitely address. So this is something uh, that came to the fore because during the pandemic, fellows had multiple reasons for why they would have increased stress compared uh, to their regular uh, duties. Some of them, of course, was work-related. I mentioned earlier that there was uh, a little bit of strain in terms of meeting uh, volume or uh, duration requirements, um, which, which added to the stress, especially if you were um, station on non-cardiovascular rotations. There was, of course, the fear of exposure to COVID because fellows do tend to act uh, as first-line responders or in, in many cardiovascular services and at many centers. Um, some fellows, of course, had to go undergo quarantine periods, in some cases because they were exposed to COVID, in, and, but in other cases, unfortunately, when they actually contracted uh, COVID as well. What this of co often meant was uh, uh, prolonged social isolation, which, which of course also adds up to the mental stress that, that fellows had to face during that time. Um, Childcare, of course, was a major issue for a lot of physicians. Um, some, in some specific situations where, bo where both partners are physicians, this was of course a bigger problem uh, than it was for, for in, in, in other situations. And then it's all, also worth mentioning that a very high proportion of cardiovascular fellows sometimes more than 25% are international medical graduates. And a lot of these fellows actually, in some cases, are living by themselves. And any time that they were benched or in situations that they had to under undergo quarantines or had to work from home, this basically meant social isolation as well. Um, in many cases, or in a lot of cases, a lot of the international graduates would tell you that they were not able to go home for periods as long as, as like one year, um, and one year at a time. And in some unfortunate cases, you had, um, because of the nature of this disease, uh, family members back home being affected um, by this, and then they were not able to address this, whether by being there in person, uh, in even in the worst of circumstances. Um, one of the other impacts, of course, was on recruitment and placements. So as we all know, last year we did not have any um, in-person interviews, we had to switch to virtual, um, which is of course the first for cardiology. Um, similarly, uh, fellows who were looking for jobs uh, at that time had to switch to virtual job interviews as well, which uh, I'll, as I'll talk about later, in some cases does have its advantages and does have its disadvantages. But uh, even the job market, as you can imagine, during the pandemic um, was, was, was not the easiest one and there was many hiring freezes. In some unfortunate cases, of course, people already had signed jobs and then those offers were withdrawn um, at, the, at the last moment. So let's just talk, so let's talk about um, the response uh, of how uh, different uh, societies and, and institutions responded to that. So one of the earliest responses that was noted was um, the switch to online learning. I want to say at least at, uh, at least our institution within a week, we had almost completely switched to online learning. Um, everyone had uh, Zoom and WebEx and Microsoft Teams on their phones and, and became quickly proficient in, in how to use them. Even people who had refused to uh, use virtual platforms for all these years. Um, there was, of course, in, in cases where the option was remote learning such as reading echocardiograms or other imaging studies from home that was also uh, that was also brought in 
Uh, there was also this thing, I guess you could call them virtual rounds, where to avoid large cardiology teams physically rounding in the hospital, you could, you could see different members of the team virtually discussing the patients with them so that you could have a minimum number of people physically rounding on those patients. And then simulated case discussions came in. This, of course, is a, not a new concept, but this was obviously expanded upon to try to make up some of the lost volumes um, in, in, many, in many of the different, uh, in, in different subspecialties. Um, there were, of course, as it has required changes to the curriculum. COVID-19, as you would imagine, was added to the curriculum. Um, there you can see Dr. Almala, I, I believe in April, gave us a presentation uh, on, on this channel about the cardiovascular considerations. Um, inpatient, in-person clinics were canceled, at least for a brief, a brief duration in most places. And quickly, fellows uh, were brought up to tune of how to engage in telemedicine. And often the learning curve for the fellows was similar to, those, to that for a lot of faculty members who had also not used telemedicine before. And of course, crisis management, so some institution would have formal courses for this, but, uh, but in all cases, everybody tr did get a little bit of a crash course on crisis management given the pandemic. Uh, professional societies did step up as well, um, uh, and different societies tried to contribute in their own ways. One of the most popular uh, initiatives that was taken was by the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, where they organized a nuclear cardiology elective. This was at a time that a lot of fellows um, were benched, or, or teams were downsized, and we had more than about 300 fellows and, and faculty members logging in, talking about and discussing nuclear cases, um, and it receive positive feedback. They, fo they followed it up this year with the Fellows Bootcamp, which again continues to be popular. Similar course was organized by the Society of uh, Cardiac CT, uh, which was designed for general cardiology fellows as well as radiology fellows with, with twice a week reading with some of the world's experts. Um, SCMR, they unlocked some uh, resources for uh, people trying to get some level of one certification and they allowed some of these simulated cases to be counted towards their final logs. TCT MD unlocked all their educational resources to, for everyone so to, and allowed uh, for education and, and blogs to be accessible to everyone. Um, uh, uh, so so th to allow more dis dissemination. And then finally, um, a lot of major cardiovascular meetings actually allow waive the regist registration fee, especially for fellows, which of course increase their participation. Um, ACGME came out with a statement um, uh, talking about uh, uh, of their guidance on competency-based medical education. This was later endorsed by the ACC Competency Management Committee. The focus of this basically was to, uh, to educate programs and leaderships on to focus on maintaining a rigorous educational environment, but have flexibility given the situation at hand. There was also a great emphasis on trying to judge fellows for competency based on uh, on just beyond volumes, based on the clinic, how, how they've been, uh, how they've uh, observed them over clinical training, and in some cases also take into consideration all the non-cardiology uh, services that they were also providing. There were some institutional initiators, and these were probably most varied throughout the country. Um, I've put up some things that, that, that were done at Methodist for us over here. There were frequent uh, graduate medical education town halls where residents and fellows were encouraged to express any concerns um, that they may have regarding their education or clinical care or safety or any assistant that they, that they wish to have. Um, there was also consistently um, uh, education re provided regarding all the resources available to all the, all the employees, including fellows and residents, about mental health resources, which were provided free, free of charge during the pandemic. And then simple things like, um, like joint Again, virtual prayers uh, for everyone once daily for people who, who find uh, th those to be beneficial. Um, Social media, uh, so there's no cardiology talk these days, which does not uh, mention social media. And as you can imagine, it was used by different people in different ways. Here you can see uh, Dr. Kanksha Thakur, who's, who's one of our co-fellows, uh, talking about the cardiovascular manifestations of COVID and the very, very popular cardio nerds um, asking everyone to share their cardiology cases. In this case, you can see how they were used uh, for education. 
Other, people's use it, other people use it differently. Here are some people uh, talking about the different uh, COVID-19 protocols as they came in and keeping the community informed and sharing ideas um, of, of how uh, their institution is, res is responding and um, any suggestions that they may have. And then other people, of course, used it to spread awareness regarding all the possible sources that they that we have. We have Brooke Moore, who is, who is one of our program managers, talking about all the resources, uh, talking about a resource uh, out there for for mental health for all, which is free of charge um, during the pandemic for uh, for all uh, for all healthcare providers. So let's just come to the lessons learned, which of course is the most important thing as far as this entire uh, pandemic is concerned. So the first realization was that there's gross underutilization of virtual platforms. I mentioned earlier that online education almost took off overnight and within a week or so, almost all cardiology programs had completely switched to online learning. The reason why this was possible was this actually did not require any new technology. These things were always there and, pro and definitely underutilized. And there was, an, according to a report, about 73% fellows gave uh, this form of learning positive feedback and mentioned that they would like this to continue in some form or the other, even when we're able to go back to inpatient didactics. There were other studies which, which reported that there was improved uh, fellow participation. Some of that, of course, has to do with logistical reasons, where some institutions will have fellows stationed at different sites, and this allows them to all, all of them to participate um, uh, to these, to the, and, uh, and sign into these conferences. Um, there is, of course, a balance, though. I've, we've all heard the argument that maybe we should all switch uh, to online education and, and maybe in-person didactics are not that relevant. This could, of course, be a talk in itself, and, and, and you, can see, you can hear this being discussed quite frequently. But there is something known as Zoom fatigue. I had to, I had to work really hard on putting up a funny meme um, regarding some people sleeping during con Zoom conferences. But that did happen. All of us, of course, are witness to it. Um, and then also, there are some things that cannot be Placed. And top of those lists will be procedures, of course. There is no, there is no way uh, that you can continue to train uh, exceptional proceduralists without giving them adequate volume, which is why some of the curriculum was designed the way that it is. There is, of course, a lot of value in the bedside and small group teaching, um, which, of course, uh, cannot, which or at least on based on feedback, could not be replaced by online, um, by online learning. And then learning from peers, especially in, uh, in procedural labs and, and imaging labs, where you have co-fellows uh, coming at your level and then teaching you, which, of course, which are on a lot of times learns for better learning compared to uh, just listening to lectures by themselves. Um, Similar uh, message for cardiovascular meetings. So ACC 2020 had almost a last minute change to a virtual platform. And what it ended up seeing was there was more than 38,000 participants for 157 countries. Now ACC is a meeting that has always been well attended with a participation from a lot of countries, but this was definitely higher than it has been in the past. Um, a contributing reason for that was of course that they made it free and, of, and, and the emphasis on the virtual aspect of it rather than just a side thing that was done in addition to the large, um, the large in-person gathering that, that that traditionally has happened, and this would of course be great if, if this continues to allow more participation for fellows. Um, fellowship interviews. So this is a mixed bag. I felt so. So, so I uh, interviewed for interventional cardiology at a t uh, in, in January and February. At that time, we were still doing in-person interviews. So, but my, my co-fellows who applied for EP and heart failure had virtual interviews. So the advantage, of course, is that you end up saving a lot of money. It's convenient. And you can end up applying to a lot more programs, as it was reported by the NRMP. The number of applicants, applications actually went up in, in the year 2020 because people were allowed because people could apply to a lot more programs but of course I think there is a value to uh, in-person interviews so maybe uh, some sort of a hybrid model that that might be uh, a consideration for the future I think the legacy of COVID-19 as far as cardiology is concerned will be the right of uh, rise of telemedicine so according to um, a report which looked at insurance claims there was in January 2020, there was 0.8 per 1,000 enrollees, uh, 0.8 encounters per 1,000 enrollees. By June 2020, that number had risen to 17.8. 17.8 might still seem like a small number, but that's about like a 2,000% rise. Um, you can see also on the graphs, um, 
you can you can see that the total number of visits uh, during COVID-19 did come down, and the number of in-person visits, of course, followed that. But if you look at the line at the bottom, that you can see is going up um, during this time, and you can, uh, and. When you look at towards the end of the graph, there seems to a little bit of a tail off that, of course, came, is, is in conjunction with in-person uh, resume. But there is an expectation that this is uh, going to remain flat and there will, all, there will be a market for this. Uh, the, S, the, S, the size of the market of, of telemedicine was about $38 billion in uh, 2020. That's the typo, I'm sorry. And by 2026, this is expected to rise to $172 billion. Um, and when this does become one of the dominant forms of how we're going to be uh, taking care of our patients, it's important that it's, this is incorporated into curriculum, even when in-person uh, uh, clinics have, have uh, resumed. Um, this is going to be a great opportunity to increase its uptake in the community. And then with, in the near future, there's gonna be a lot of conversation about reimbursements um, and legislation and CMS regarding uh, telemedicine. And, and at that time, if we were training fellows at this point in time about telemedicine disadvantages, it disadvantages uh, discussions about uh, patient safety and, 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 and protecting their privacy. Um, this is gonna to lead to better legislation in the future. Social media, this is always a, a double-edged sword. Um, like I mentioned, everybody uses it sort of differently. And as you can imagine, in, in a time where um, where, where, where in-person uh, contact was minimal, social media gained even more prominence. But it also acted as a pretty good crash course of what to do and what not to do. Um, the pandemic saw that the, that the entire world, including the medical community, was divided upon how to tackle this crisis. And um, it's important to remember that we are physicians. This is a public platform uh, with patients who have access to our opinions. So it's important to be careful with what, we're, what message we're seeing and how we're seeing it even more importantly. Um, the other thing, of course, we learned is that uh, there was this trend towards trying to be the first one to report or, come to, or jump to conclusions. Twitter is not fact-checked, um, so it's important that we're careful with what message we're sending out there, both to our peers as well as, as our patients. Finally, I think one of the lessons that we did learn and one of the more important lessons we learned is, 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 is our discussions around how we're training fellows. So there has been an inertia generally about how we've been training fellows over the last two or three decades practically. And the pandemic actually saw a greater fellow involvement in these conversations of how uh, the best way is to train these fellows while we were trying to come up with newer, newer techniques. Um, you can see a lot of blogs and podcasts regarding the traditional versus novel methods of training. Um, there's also conversations about flexibility regarding training sites and the duration uh, of training. And then I mentioned earlier about the competency being the focus rather than just numbers alone. Um, so I, I feel like this is a, a good opportunity for all the programs to discuss with their fellows of how they want to move uh, in the future, trying to adapt some methods that were that their hands were forced on, but some of the older methods which continue to, to be popular. Um, I think that's going to be the end of my talk. I'd just like to acknowledge Dr. Nadine Faza, who's our Assistant Program Director, in helping me select the topic and, and going over my slides. Um, and then I'm open for any questions or, or comments. That's great. <coughs> Thank you, Hassan. That was uh, very interesting and obviously timely. Um, it's great to get the fellow's perspective on, on on the impact of this disruption, and you know, and, and as you mentioned, it's been a it's been a disruption in every level, um, and a chronic disruption now going on 15, 18 months, depending on on where you are and how you were affected. Um, you know, you very you know uh, correctly commented on the uh, the changes in content delivery in medical education. Um, one of the challenges we see as program directors is also, um, and one of the things you didn't mention, is the challenges in evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's as you move through training, the, you know, there's a lot of time and energy and uh, history in how we evaluate people, how we were evaluated, and all of a sudden that wasn't available. Uh, so yeah, another layer of the disruption is how you, how do you know your progress throughout these events? Mm -hmm. um, very challenging. Um, and I think you very importantly brought up the issue of, of mental health. And you know, a lot of us are at the stage in this pandemic where 
you know, we see the light, we have vaccines, we're all sitting here unmasked, and we see change coming out. But what none of us know is what will be the legacy of this mm -hmm. uh, in the training deficits potentially, uh, in the career choices, in the financial and legislative arenas that will impact maybe, maybe all of us for years to come. Mm -hmm. Um, but the resilience is, is incredible uh, of how we got to be here still and how we've managed to maintain the medical care. And, you know, one, I saw recently a conversation that was very interesting, and it was around how, how well we have managed to pivot in the science delivery, mm -hmm. right? I mean, imagine 25, 30 years ago. Maybe hard for you. Um, <laughs> for us, you know, when there was no Internet or when we had dial-up Internet and we had no smartphones, no wearables, uh, no iPads to communicate with patients, no access to internet, no global education. Dealing with this level of pandemic at that time would be even more unimaginable than what we had to deal with. But the challenge, and a lot of it what you've mentioned, is, is where we still struggle is the art of medicine, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly in cardiology. You know, it's the bedside interaction, the physical exam findings, the, the hands-on nuance of a procedure. Um, very difficult to have any sort of digital interaction that way. Um, even just sitting with a patient as, as, a, as a fellow or as a faculty, you know, do they understand what I'm saying? What's their facial expression? Am I getting through to them? You know, all of that is the art, mm -hmm. um, which takes experience and interaction. Uh, and that's still a big void of where, of where we are today. So you're finishing one important chapter of fellowship, starting mm -hmm. another important f chapter of fellowship now, clearly seeing beyond fellowship. Where's the opportunity today that, that you see? You've, you've thought a lot about this now. What, where do you think uh, we as a program or collectively as a society should be focusing a little bit more energy as we, as we come out of this, hopefully? Okay, so I think, um, so a couple of things that I think we could probably um, uh, work on. I think as a program, I, firstly, I'd like to say, I think our response was, was very, very great. I think, like I mentioned, within a week, we were switched to online education. And I think in terms of didactics, I would say that most of our fellows would say, I think we've, we've done pretty well. As far as that goes, of course, not being able to think control things that are not under control, like, like, like the things that you mentioned. Um, in terms of um, what we should do in the future, regardless of, of where things from go, uh, go from here, is the whole concept of, of collaboration and education just beyond your own institutions, I feel. Um, like I mentioned, the ASNIC uh, nuclear elective was very, very popular. Some, one of the reasons why that was popular was because you had um, leading experts and some of the greatest educators, which uh, only a few a number of fellows had at their own institution access to, all of a sudden all the cardiology fellows had access to. Um, I think that's one thing that definitely needs to continue, where, whether it be professional societies or whether how we do it on our YouTube channel, we try to continue to educate all the cardiology community, not just our own fellows or our own faculty. I think that's going to be important. And the other one, I do think the whole idea of telemedicine, I feel, um, it, it is something that I feel uh, was always here, uh, even before the pandemic started. Uh, it was it was obviously not uh, utilized frequently, but we've, as fellows over here, all uh, had exposure to it, and I think we've learned a lot from it. We've seen how well the patients have responded to it, and how some of them continue to uh, see us virtually rather than come in person. So I think those are the two things I feel like uh, should continue even after the pandemic um, is, is over, hopefully very soon. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, so I think we'll close. We're at time. I'll close with a comment from Dr. Zogby, our chairman. He says, thank you for the most inspiring talks. Love the perspectives and topic interests of our graduating fellows. So Dr. Rostein, Dr. Raymond, thank you both very much for joining thank us you. today thank and for, for educating all of us. All right. Bye-bye.